Okay. I think it's working. I don't know. Um, anyway, thank you, Merit, for coming in. You're in South Coast group number two. We'll wait maybe a few more seconds, Becky, for everybody to cycle in, and then we can start um, walking through these discussion questions. Sounds good. Great, so for anyone who just came in, you're in the South Coast uh, number two breakout room. Thank you everyone for coming by today. I'm excited for this conversation. Um, okay, if everybody is ready to go, um, I think I'm gonna ask all of you to unmute because we're a pretty small group. Um, and then Becky, I would welcome you to start um, asking me questions and I will screen share where I'm gonna be taking notes in real time. If you see me write anything incorrectly in the notes, feel free to speak up. Great, so we're ready to go. Every We don't have anybody else joining that you know of? Um, I think everybody uh, who was gonna join should be in here. Um, if anybody else cycles in, we'll welcome them in the chat. Awesome, thank you, Avery. And thank you everybody again for being here this evening and helping us work through this important process that um, we all are, are interested to see how it's gonna come out at the other end. So a lot of you receive some of the big questions that we'd like to get from you this evening. And again, like I said, it's going to help us understand um, perspectives and concerns and um, how, we, how we move forward on this and, and what all to include and make sure we cover in the, in the decadal management review. So, you know, the first question um, that we were hoping that we could get some feedback from you on is what role would you like your community to play in the MPA management program moving forward? Meaning not just in 2022, but also beyond, you know, with whatever happens um, with the program moving forward. Um, that's question one. I'm just going to read them all and we'll start at the beginning. Um, and then the second question is, what are your highest priority topics or issues and sources of information that should be considered in the Cato Management Review? We've already talked about a few things and a lot of things that we're gonna be including in the review, but if there are other things, a high priority topics or issues, we'd like to know about that. And then how would you um, define measures and or assess progress towards the Marine Life Protection Act goals? And then the last question, if we get there, um, any other reflections or recommendations regarding the MPA management and the role of the ocean community in the broader MPA program. So we'll just start with the first one, um, if that's okay. And you know, what role would you like your community to play in the MPA management program moving forward? And this is a pretty informal. I think Avery, are we raising hands or blurting out or what are we doing? Um, so we're a small group, so everybody's unmuted right now. If you have background noise, feel free to remute yourself. Um, and I just want to make sure, can everybody see my screen? And is the font big enough? I cannot uh, actually read it. It's pretty small. It's a little small. Anyway, yeah. Okay, I'm going to make it bigger. Um, and yeah, it looks like Chase has his hand raised. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Um, Hi. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I was living in Hawaii in college when the last time that MLPAs were essentially established. So I wasn't able to really be involved too much then. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my question is going forward when, when the decadal review really happens, can there be small uh, community groups convened of uh, conservationists, uh, environmentalists, commercial fishermen that can really have input. Uh, like for, take Laguna Beach, for example. Um, it would be great if we were able to establish a Laguna Beach kind of commission or committee and to get input from, you know, people of all walks of life. Mm -hmm. When it comes time for this to be, you know, reviewed, um, because I feel like when the first go around, there wasn't 
that much input from sport fishing, the sport fishing community. And Laguna is primarily uh, more, I would say, aligned with an environmental kind of mentality. So, I don't know. Um, uh, Chase, I think that um, it's a it's a good um, comment and a, and an interesting one. I think that when when Chen Chen talked about the uh, community collaboratives, that's kind of what's happening now as well. But if it's something different, that um, that would be good to know. Um, the collaborative network, as she mentioned, and there is a pretty active one in Laguna in Orange County. Um, the collaborative network is, is exactly what you're talking about in terms of a variety of people and different interests from recreational fishermen, commercial fishermen, tribes, NGOs. It's very similar, um, very similar to how the MPAs were planned and remembering that the regional stakeholder group for the MPAs are the ones who decided where they were gonna go and, and, and what the regulations would be for each one. I think it would be really helpful, Chase, to know a little bit more about what you're thinking. Is it different than that? And, and that, that, that would be helpful to know about this because I'd like to know more about what you're thinking in terms of the small groups because there are these community collaboratives that do exist. And a lot of those collaboratives are very involved in outreach and education materials. A lot of them would like to be more involved in the science. Um, so, um, but I, I, I agree, it would be great. I think part of the problem is, you know, for example, tonight, this, this whole uh, Zoom is, you know, you look at the participation, there's very little sport fishermen participation. Um, you know, I have, not seen personally anyone that that I know or recognize and I think the main reason for that is just there wasn't like a lot of publicity for this you oh. know in the, the sport fishing community and I you know that that fault probably lies on the sport fishing community but a part of me thinks that you know that the a lot of the councils don't necessarily want a lot of participation from the sport fishing community. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to find like the link to this meeting is pretty much buried, you know, online. It was hard for me to, to mm -hmm. even like find it. Um, and, and that's really important for us to know, Chase, and also would like to know how better to reach out to the sport fish community. I mean, we, we do have, uh, a number of folks on the phone, on the on the line you, uh, today that are recreational fishermen, <clears throat> maybe not um, all that you know, but I think it's important what you're saying. And so, better ideas of how best to reach out is is really important, not just for these the next three webinars coming up, but also just for the the review in and of itself and what's happening and the decadal management review and what that is and what it isn't and. How to, and, and what is it going to be like moving forward? So um, definitely interested on in how better, how, how to, to communicate that better to that community. I mean, I think one way would be to involve some of the, you know, sport fishing groups, you know, like AFCO, for example. And I did see somebody from AFCO was on here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they're very respected within the Southern California fishing community. And they also have like a wide reach within mm -hmm. active fishermen. I think maybe bringing them on board is like maybe a somebody that you guys could could work with to help get the message out on these meetings would would be one way to get more involvement. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say about you know the community and moving forward is a lot better communication, you yeah. know about what's going on and a lot better reach out so that people can um, participate in the discussion and um, and then the small community groups, um, which the collaboratives are very much like that. And I would also, and we can um, definitely provide information, you know, to the collaborative network for anybody who's interested. But 
but um, those small groups, it's, it's really what's important um, for the department and the management um, to be able to have those community groups help us. And that's what's been very great about this whole process is the network um, uh, collaborative network, but then also the regional stakeholder process uh, was critical in putting these MPAs in. So it's it, that that involvement of the community is really important. Thank you. You're welcome. Great, Very thank good. you Chase for your input and thank you Becky for those responses. Um, for some reason, I can't see anyone's name. So I welcome the gentleman in the blue button down to ask a question. Uh, Marty. Marty. Marty Golden. I, I wanted to comment on Chase's comments. I thought I agreed with a lot of them. I did want to comment on one specific thing. He mentioned AFCO. It's A-F-T-C-O, not what you have written in there. A-F-T-C-O. Thank you, Marty. AFCO. Uh, but additionally, there are, a, there are quite a number of uh, sport fishing and recreational fishing groups out there. CCC is one. Yep. Uh, CCA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, SAC. Uh, sport, they're the Charter Boat Association. I'm not sure that either of those groups are represented. Well, maybe one of them. I think I saw Wendy on here, so maybe CCA is. I'm here. I'm a SAC state board member. I'm also or, or a CCA state board member. I've also been a member of the Sport Fishing Association of California, and a board member for about 10 years, and I'm on the Crown Fish Advisory Subpanel for the Pacific Fishery Management Council now. Um, Hi, Merritt. I have to say that if, it, it sounds like the failure was, could have been on our end. We certainly got the message, and I don't think we spread it far enough. Uh -huh. yeah, I happened to get the message at about two o'clock this afternoon on an email from uh, the Collaborative. Mm -hmm. So that's how my advance notice came to me this today. And uh, I try to pay attention to a lot of what's going on on these issues. And so I, th I think when you talk about what the role should be for the community, the key part of that is to keep the community, community informed as to what's happening and where they can be involved and where they can find out about stuff on a regular basis. Okay, we, we will, thank you, thank you very much, Marty, for that, and, and um, we will work with our, our steering committee, key communicators on that as well, that we have um, pulled together to help us get the message out, um, and um, we'll, we'll work on doing a better job of that, and, and moving forward as well, that it's really important to try to get that out there, and that's that's half the battle right there is to get in the message out to everybody. So really appreciate that. Hello, Becky. This is Louis Zim. Hi, Louis Zim. Hello to all you, all my good friends here that uh, launched me on my career in federal <laughs> fishery management, the PFMC. Um, I, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, Merritt McRae uh, is also a writer for Western Outdoor News, which many of the folks that are involved in sport fishing here in Southern California uh, read, but my biggest concern is to get to the community that uh, fishes on piers and off beaches and occasionally goes out on the sport fishing, uh, sport fishing boats. So we yeah. need some way to get to the underrepresented folks. You know, there's yeah. a lot of us here. You can see that a lot of us here are already connected. Uh, I am sorry, Marty wasn't in there. Marty actually was one of the people that started me in my career. So um, I think we need to really look at getting these, uh, these folks that are on the fishing piers, is what I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, and on the beaches, um, even people that just casually go to the beach because they may casually go uh, to a marine protected area, not know it, and uh, start t tide pool picking. Uh, yeah. So this is where we have to reach out to the somehow to the general public that's not directly involved in all this great fishery stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. That's fishing peers. P I E R S. -E -R -S. -E -R -S. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, just just brainstorming yeah. here. I think a good way to reach out to more people and a more diverse audience could be to find kind of nexus points to what marine protected areas are. So working with restaurants or 
-hmm. working with uh, colleges, working with um, businesses as well. So how do we bring a lot, working with cities, um, how do we make, you know, maybe even a community event or like a farmer's market, mm -hmm. just anything where we reach out to people. I'm just, I'm just kind of brainstorming some solutions here because it is kind of, you know, this particular meeting was meant to be for the recreational boating community. Right. So, so it is definitely um, like a very clear gap, uh, this yeah. mark, the marketing. And I think it has to do a lot with funding too. Um, so bringing in the right amount of funds to reach out to people and even with social media, you know, exploiting that in some way, shape or form, um, just getting more people involved uh, and more underrepresented and disadvantaged communities as well. Uh, definitely. And I mentioned before, um, Andrea, thanks for that. And it's something that is very um, important to, to the Department of Fish and Wildlife as well as Ocean Protection Council to, to, to work on doing that very thing. And as, as Tova had mentioned, um, there is a statewide leadership team of which has a lot of different state and federal agencies on it and tribal representatives um, working on a plan to, to do just that to those underserved, uh, unrepresented communities. And, and it's, it's something, the outreach to the greater community and especially those who may not come to the coast very often, as we saw during COVID, <laughs> um, where a lot of people were coming to the coast to escape the heat or just be able to get out and about or to augment their, their um, food on the table, we mm -hmm. ran into a big problem down south with tide pools. And mm -hmm. um, it's always um, a challenge to, to, to reach out but um, yeah. and to grab everybody. And it's definitely... Definitely an important piece for sure. I appreciate those comments. Yeah. And I mean, I'm part of the MPA collaborative, the Los Angeles yeah. collaborative. Mm -hmm. And I think something that would be really great would be just getting a clearer understanding on tribal communities and how to like appropriately represent that involvement in the work that we do, especially as a working in a nonprofit, um, working with recreational voters. So mm -hmm. giving them the acknowledgement um, and, you know, how do we do that? What's the best way to do it? Um, and then also learning from tribal communities as well. Maybe they can be more involved in MPA collaboratives. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, or maybe I can involve myself more in other <laughs> events that tribal communities are hosting where, you know, people can join, but I'm not aware of those events. So that would be really great um, to know more about. And I hear you that that's something that you're working on. So I'm, I'm really excited to learn more about it. So. Great, thank you. Um, any more thoughts about you know, the best way or how you want your community to play a role in the MPA management? Um, I'm having trouble raising my hand virtually. Uh oh. Now you can do it. Yeah. Hey, hi, Jake. Hi. <laughs> hi, I'm Jake Russell. Um, I'm from uh, uh, San Diego. Uh, I've started a nonprofit down here, uh, mm -hmm. rvplar.inc. We have a little research. <laughs> We're um, working on um, sustainability. We, we advocate for sustainability access and removal of ocean plastic. Ah. Um, I guess, you know, I could, I could say a lot of things, but, you know, and, and by the way, I've, I've had no trouble connecting and, and uh, finding the meeting. Um, I think you guys gave me notice a week or two ago and, and I stuck with it and had no problems connecting. So, um, so for that, um, I guess, you know, it's so comprehensive. It looks like a lot of things are being covered. There's one thing though that I haven't heard and, and that is, is there a cleanup component uh, to this? I know we're all working towards, you know, 30 for 30. Um, I think what we're interested in is, um, you know, what's happening with microplastic and it entering the food chain and, um, you know, what happens to the fish and what happens to us after we eat the fish. I think it's something that 
Um, you know, obviously it's just, uh, just, just happening. We're just getting uh, information, research information on what, what the effects are. Um, so I, I guess that would be the broader question. Is there any plan through any of this where, you know, we look at cleanup or we look at, you know, what these MPAs uh, look like, you know, at that level? Um, that's a really good point. Uh, it's um, not in the cards for this particular assessment because we're looking at really how the MPAs are, are performing, Jake, but clearly marine debris in general, <laughs> including plastics and microplastics, are, are really important to, along with, you know, just even uh, pollution runoff and all kinds of things affecting the ocean, which is beyond, more above and beyond just MPAs. It's, it's really the ocean environment and ecosystem in general that we need to worry about along with those lines. Um, so that's, that's certainly, and, and we are, for example, we are looking at climate change impacts, you know, the climate resiliency report, which is not the same thing what you're talking about, but it's a little bit of a start. Um, so I'm hearing that that would be something to definitely um, uh, include moving forward in thinking about management of the MPAs that we would consider the cleanup of plastics for sure, but in general, marine debris. I'd say man-made pollution. I don't know what else to go. call it, but um, you know, obviously, we one of the things we advocate for and we encourage people to do. We're trying to move the you know the success of beach cleanups out out right. to the water and, mm -hmm. and pick up trash, showing people how to pick up trash on the water and specifically uh, mylar balloons. We're trying to um, you know uh, we'd love to get those banned in the state. It would be great if uh, you know somehow through um, you know trying to uh, get thirty for thirty. Um, through and working with these MPAs and all the other things that happen, if somehow we could, you know, get that tied in there, um, you know, for, for obvious reasons, um, the, the balloons uh, obviously are mistaken for food, they can entangle. Um, also, the balloons are uh, metallic and uh, can cause power outages when they hit land and, and uh, you know, can cause a, a lot of um, uh, off time for production, you know, uh, when, when these outages happen, although they can also start for, uh, fires. So um, mm -hmm. anyway, that's just an example of one of the things we're trying to do. And it would be nice if um, somehow there was some language tied into these MPAs and going forward that we would look at, you know, you know, biology on that level, see if there's microplastics in the fish and, and that if there's anything we can do to mitigate, uh, you know, trash over these MPAs. Great. Thank you for that. Can um, I get on to the other subjects before the 15 minutes runs out? You can, yes. Yeah, I think we'll just quickly go to Andrea's raised hand, and then I think we will be ready to move on to the next question. Uh -huh. Does that sound good? Um, yeah. Hello, hello. Anybody can hear me? Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. So I think we're going to uh, go to Andrea's raised hand, and then we can go to the 44175. Oh, okay. Okay, I um I already spoke, so I'll be brief. But um I think something that could be really useful would be, especially when it comes to bringing together the the marine protected area uh, uh, work and report that's that's gonna come out of this uh, conversation to the thirty by thirty. Maybe even talking, maybe somehow connecting it to what has been done across the world. I mean, marine protected areas are not not like novel management systems. And I think if we can bring in information uh, from their success internationally, you know, all over the world, that could be a good way to start talking about the science. And there could be even information on marine debris as connected to marine protected areas. I mean, there's mm -hmm. just so many different types and yeah. So anyways. Great, thank you, thank you Andrea, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, and then the phone number that just spoke up, we'd love to hear from you. Hello? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Oh, okay, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you mind stating okay, your Okay, yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Volker Hohen. I'm a member of the San Diego MPA Collaborative and I sit in on quite a few of the other collaboratives. I, in my opinion, they, MPAs are 
going very well. An area of opportunity that I see is the inner title enforcement uh, for the general public. In particular, also inner title that includes sand area. So people are uh, taking seashells within an MPA. That's a form of take. It's a biologic object. Um, I think it would help if we issued more citations to the non-fishing community for MPA violations. And two factors. One is it would get them to stop taking the starfish. And two, they would also then realize, hey, we already have a bunch of reserves before they vote in more reserves. So targeting uh, compliance by the non-fishermen. Thank you. Thank you, Volker. Thank you for your input. Okay, um, Becky, are you ready to move on to the next question? Yeah. So the um, next question is, what are your highest priority topics or issues and sources of information that should be considered in the Decato Management Review? We've gone through a little bit of these um, with first question, but Marty, I think, um, Avery, I think Marty wanted to speak on a different topic, I think. Yeah, yeah. I have one. One uh, quick comment about the looking thing, looking at things here, and one of them I think needs to be looked at closely is how the MPA boundaries are marked or uh -huh. not marked. Uh, I know there's a ton of maps out there, and that's great, and there are latitude and longitude things all over the place. But in terms of being on the water, it can be pretty tricky to figure out whether you're inside the boundaries or outside of the boundaries. And uh, I've seen maps where they have the boundaries on the map, but the map is not connected into your GPS. So we need to get maps that are interfaced with the GPS systems, A, and then B, where we can put buoys out I would suggest putting them out, even if you can't put buoys around the entire MPA because it's not feasible. Where it is feasible, I think you could put buoys out. I, I suspect a lot of people that are getting ticketed for fishing in the MPAs are there because they didn't realize they were there. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see them look at that a lot closer in terms of how to be able to inform people. Okay, great. That. Perfect. Thank you, Marty. That's an important piece. Thank you. So it looks like um, we'll move to, sorry, I can't see anyone's names, but I think Lily. Oh, you thank like you that? very much. Yeah, that you got it right. Uh, I just want to urge you to um, uh, interface, shall we say, with the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, you've got some great people in the department, uh, Marcy Yurenko, uh, for one, uh, that can uh, give you a lot of information on how the MPAs uh, are working in conjunction with federal fishery management. And uh, also um, in our assessments that we do on the, at the fe on federal fisheries levels, um, we need to uh, get information on how the MPAs are uh, helping the various stocks to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve Wirtz mentioned the, uh, I think it was CCRA. Um, we've seen some of that information. We'd love to see some more. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain species that we're working right now. One's quillback rockfish, where a large uh, proportion of the population is actually in MPAs. Right. And however, we're looking at that population perhaps being depleted. So we need to have that information. Uh, so we need information on the PFMC and we can provide information for you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Louie. And just so you know, I have um, staff <clears throat> also at PFMC. Eric Wilkins is on the Habitat Committee um, and Chris Potter is also just joined for the other um, offshore wind group. Um, we, I'm in close contact, we're in close contact with uh, the groundfish staff in the department all the time. And um, yes, I would love to see how we can best integrate that information. Um, oh, and John Budrick has also helped on, on a lot of things uh, from the PFMC council, from the council and um, on MPA. So more of that in the future would be really, really super helpful. So thank you for that comment. They're all excellent people, Eric, John, all those folks that you named are, are, are very good. 
And uh, yes, uh, we are needing to in, uh, involve uh, uh, wind energy coming up here. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the big one for us planning. Um, we may be very fortunate to have the MPAs that perhaps can exclude uh, some uh, wind energy problems. And then of course the sanctuaries as well. Sure. Uh, that may be another uh, good source is the marine sanctuaries. Yeah, Thank the you. marine sanctuaries are definitely, they're on the leadership team as well. So we are plugged into all state and federal agencies that we can talk into being on the leadership team. So we really very much appreciate those comments. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Great, thank you. So I think we'll go here from Merritt and then here from Andrea and then um, open the floor to anybody who hasn't spoken up yet. And thank then I'm you. thinking we'll move on to the next question. So uh, Merritt, what, let, us, let us know what you're thinking. Hi, I'm Merritt. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in uh, ultimately getting some kind of an assessment out of the review that uh, outlines which MPAs have had uh, monitoring work going on. And, and my suspicion is that there are a good number of them, especially those that are relatively inaccessible that really have not had any work whatsoever done and are just somewhat languishing out there with the designation and, and no real contribution. Mm -hmm. um, I, the, the ones that come to mind are like Richardson's Rock and Bag Rock, those that are yeah. pretty far offshore and and like, uh, they're hard for science to get out to. A few fishermen get out there, but they're not allowed in. So you don't know, you know, what the status is. No, that's, that's a really good um, point, um, Merritt. And I don't know, just as a, the one thing I forgot to mention on my presentation today was the long-term um, monitoring action plan that the department and the Ocean Protection Council um, authored, gosh, back in 2018. Um, it can be found on our website, um, the MPA webpage for the Decatur Management Review that's on our website. Um, in there is Appendix B, which is all the indicators that we're looking at, potentially looking at, and it's what the, um, the Decatur Management Review work group also used um, to look at, at potential recommendations moving forward. So um, that's a, a really good point and um, something if you haven't looked at that, it's, it's worthwhile checking out um, based on um, what you just said, Merit. So I, I thank you for that and, and we'll, we'll do what we can to get to that piece in the, in the plan and the review. Any other, before we move on, every, any, any, I think you were gonna to go to people who haven't had a chance uh, to speak. Yeah, so I think first we're gonna to go to Andrea and then open the floor to anybody who hasn't spoken okay. up yet. Um, I just wanted to mention, I think a couple of, I wouldn't say they're issues, but they're mm -hmm. kind of opportunities that okay. I've, I've noticed that could be improved is, I think it's a little bit, sometimes it's a little bit confusing for someone who's just being exposed to a marine protected area at first to understand what it is there's a lot of confusion on the terminology you know there's three different types of mpas but then inside of that there's one type of uh conservation area that's no take right and then there's management areas and then there's special closures and all those terms are very confusing and there's a lot of history involved in this but also you know history in marine sanctuaries and um, so I think that making that a little bit more accessible um, okay. and transparent could be a great way to, to help with like teaching folks about this um, and, and it being more accessible to them. Um, I think strategically looking into data that relates to recreational fishermen. So yeah. we have those fishing, that data of the amount of fish that is being caught. So what are the most targeted species and how are MPAs affecting those particular species? Yeah. I think that that's something that, you know, the, anyone would want to read about, but especially the folks that are using that resource most uh, intensely. And then the last thing I would say is, um, I, I would love to know more information about how do recreational fishermen use MPAs? Do they mm -hmm. use a GPS when they're in the MPA? How well is this area enforced and do they understand um, you know, the deep, like what is going on in the, in the water basically. And 
is is there what is the knowledge level in the water and and is there something that you know the scientific or or the nonprofit community I should say is missing here something that could help us that we want to learn more about our audience you know like I I feel like there's not enough information on what's going on in the water just publicly available so it'd be super super useful to reach this audience okay fantastic thank you that's a great suggestion one thing I would just quickly say, and, and, and Marty mentioned this earlier, and, and and that question also like touched on it, is when you're out on your boat, all the GPSs are are updated constantly with the like, current MLPAs. Mm -hmm. So it's very evident, like if you're within an MLPA or not. Mm -hmm. And every angler that I know that that has a boat is very aware of the MLPAs and cognizant of staying outside the boundaries when they're when they're fishing. Okay. I just I have to leave. I just wanted to to quickly say okay. one more thing and and one of the th my biggest concern with with the MLPA in Laguna Beach is you guys mentioned access and for for people that unlike me don't have access to a boat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Laguna Beach has always been one of the best spots for fishing from shore just because of the topography of the coastline with the rocky points and whatnot and the different coves. I think having, you know, 80% of the Laguna coast being in a no fishing zone is really taking a prime uh, fishing area away from people that don't have access to boats. And the other thing I, I really just want to touch on is that I personally feel that restricting access to fishing also takes away the individual stewardship of the environment. And by having, you know, 10 years of kids growing up without being participants in the environment, in the sport fishing, learning about following fishing game regulations and guidelines and catch and release and all these important things. Um, you know, it's not having that stewardship is that cancel out the importance of developing the marine life and bringing back the kelp forests and all that if people don't appreciate that it's even there if they're not participating in it. Um, so just something that I think is important to evaluate when this is all sussed out. Thank you, Chase. And thank, thank you, you for joining us. Appreciate that. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chase. And thank you for all you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Can I touch on one thing real quick? Yeah, of course. You know, one of the things I've learned, you know, being born here and, and uh, growing up here, I was pretty fortunate uh, in La Jolla, obviously, uh, uh, had an MPA for most of my life there at the Cove. And, uh, you know, it's it's been great. Uh, on the other hand, the one in Pacific Beach, not so much. Uh, that's why I think they all need to be kind of considered on an individual basis. Um, the other thing is, I just want to shout out the uh, <clears throat> state um, fish and wildlife, you know, they've done a pretty good job with fishery fisheries management, I think, in this state. And, you know, we rely on the state scientists to tell us, hey, you know, fish for this one, don't fish for this one, it needs to be this big, don't catch it this time of year, got to have a season for that. And, and I think that's an important part of what we're talking about. It's, it's not just MPAs, it's um, fisheries management and as well, maybe enhancement. You know, another thing here in Pacific Beach, we have a couple of wrecks and um, they've, been, they've been great for, uh, you know, bringing in more life. And it's something I don't think we do enough of in California um, that we should do more of um, is, is augmenting the, um, you know, the resource. Uh, through that kind of a program. Anyway, just want to throw that out there. Thank you, Jake. 
And I think Avery, we've got just a few minutes left. Um, if yeah. if we could go maybe to the third question. Um, yeah, that's great. We have nine minutes left. So. Yeah. So the third question is: How would you define, measure, and or assess progress towards Marine Life Protection Act goals? Now, that's a big question because <laughs> there are six goals and they're very broad, but. Um, any ideas on how you would define um, progress towards meeting the goals of the act? What 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 does that mean to you? May I? May I? Yeah, go ahead. Hello? Go ahead. Yeah, I would say I know we have met our goal when society stops pressing for more MPAs <laughs> because then we. It's more of a public policy and, and PR thing than a fishing thing. Okay. One of the goals, this Louie again, uh, one of the goals of the MPA, as I remember it, was uh, uh, had to do with conduct, connectiv connectivity yeah. and larval recruitment. Yeah. And uh, we're, we've been very concerned with this on the PFMC, uh, how much benefit to the whole stock of fishes the MPA has, uh, has provided us with. And it's a very difficult uh, thing to research, but that I would love to see much more research on, on uh, whether the, uh, the stocks that are inside the MPA are augmenting the stocks outside. Uh, that, that is particularly critical in the sense that now that the commercial and sport fishing fleets have less area to fish, they need more augmentation. And uh -huh. hopefully the MPAs are helping with that, but perhaps they're not, we, we need to do that. Uh, one of the other big problems real quickly is uh, when we do assessments, about half, 50% of our assessment data comes from fishery dependent information, and we no longer can get fishery dependent information uh -huh. out of the NPAs. So uh -huh. that's always, that's been a big challenge for us. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, I kind of amplify what Louis said. We need to get a handle on how the fish stocks have been enhanced by the EPA, uh, by the MPAs, and to what extent to quantify the enhancement, if in fact there has been enhancement. Uh -huh. There's been some work that's been done on that, but uh -huh. from what I've seen, it's not exactly the most definitive thing. Uh -huh. So I think that the goal of the MPA is supposedly to enhance the fish stocks, I think. And so we need to try to pin that down. It's going to cost money. And okay. some of that money is needs to be used to replace the fact that, as Louis mentioned, 50% of the data is from fish, used to be from fisheries uh, dependent information. Now you don't have that. So you have to, if you're not going to have fisheries dependent information, you have to spend research money to get that information. I was a little concerned. I, I looked, uh, you know, up how much, how many permits have been issued in MPAs to do research. Uh -huh. I think it was last year or the year before. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, 1,024 MPAs. I think there was only 60 some odd permits for research in all those MPAs. It seems to me. Oh, there's more than that, Jay. Is there? Okay. Yeah, it seems yeah. to me, I hope there is, you know, that was my hope. I thought that that was, it seemed awfully slight. Oh, there, there, there's many, many more than that. And um, I'm only saying that because I know the scientific collecting permit for the marine region is in my program. So, so I think um, there's many more to the point that, and hopefully you guys can, can um, appreciate this. Early on, one of the concerns we had was, well, how much of a good thing is too much Too much of a good thing with regards to uh, the amount of research in, in any given MPA or collectively cumulative. Um, so we did develop an, a, a, um, an assessment model to assess the impact as a result. And so we'll, we will often say no <laughs> um, to, a, to a, a, a scientific collecting permit if there's already you know, a number of, of research uh, projects going on in an individual MPA. So, so we're, we're watching that, but there, I can, I can definitely tell you there's more than 60 for sure. And do you get, do you get the, 
the funding you need, I mean, in, uh, over the Chicago <laughs> review, um, I mean, is, is, sorry, is sorry, it up and down, just like I would imagine, or what? What? How does that work? Uh, were go you ahead, gonna, go ahead, Avery. What were you going to say? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say we only have about five minutes left, and I would love to give anybody who hasn't spoken yet. I think they're about five the chance to share any last reflections or recommendations you might have about MPA management, um, or any thoughts you have about any of the previous questions. Uh, sorry to cut you off there, but I want to give everybody a chance. No, thank you, Avery. We we could go down all kinds of little rabbit holes for sure. So sorry about sorry about that, Jake. So yeah, I'm just going to ask uh, folks to unmute and speak up if you have anything to add. I just wanted to quickly add that to me, an effective MPA really is not just about the MPA, but I would say. It's effective when the entire network works together as an effective tool for climate change resiliency for the entire coast. So how does that entire network, you know, work together? Like maybe one of the MPAs isn't exactly showing localized data on larval recruitment, right? But the one much further north is. Um, so all of that could potentially be connected because of climate change and things that we don't quite understand yet and how that's impacting the coast. So I think that's, that's to me how that system will be successful. The only when it works as a network. Thank you, Andrea. Anyone else? Any other reflections, recommendations, the role in program, whatever you might, or any, or going back to any of the, any of these questions. And knowing, you know, that everybody is welcome to join the other three, <laughs> um, the other three um, webinars that we're going to have, we're focusing on different um, groups, but everybody's welcome to join. So um, you'll have another opportunity if you should decide to join us again. I'm, if I may, sure. um, I'm really interested in the socio, the social aspect of the, 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 let me back up. I'm really interested in the social drivers that motivate the people that push for more closures. I've been sitting in on quite a few of the 3030 meetings. It's an endless monologue of we need more closures, save the uh, endangered anchovies. And I'm thinking, I'd really like to get in their heads and figure out <laughs> how do we address this core need to ban fishing? Okay. And I'd like to add to that, uh, Becky, we are coming into a time with huge populations and we have still population growth and a lot of challenges and we need to look at how we're going to feed people and uh, fisheries, are one of the most efficient ways to bring protein to the nation, to the public, um, much more efficient than uh, say cattle ranching or chicken ranching. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I think we need to keep an eye on, on that and think about how we're gonna feed the world here. This is one way we can do it by uh, uh, improving our fisheries, and if MPAs can help with that, I'm all for it. If MPAs hold that back, and uh, we come up with a shortage of uh, fisheries protein in the nation, uh, then that will be a problem. And the Magnuson Stevens Act addresses that. So, thank you. Thank you, Louis. Great. Well, we have about 10 seconds left. I just want to <laughs> say thank you, everybody, for all of your input. Um, this was amazing. I hope you stick around for the last 10 minutes to hear about next steps and how you can keep staying engaged.